Welcome to the Delve Podcast, produced by Delve, the McGill University Desotel Faculty of Management's thought leadership platform. In this special episode, we're pleased to feature Nobel Prize winner in economics and MIT professor Bengt Holstrom in conversation with Desotel professor and Delve editor in chief Saku Montre. Their conversation addresses some of the most vital management and leadership questions of our time. What does a business firm for the future look like? Are the hierarchical bureaucracies that we all know and well adore going to be a thing of the past one day? My name is Saku Mantere. I'm a professor of strategy and organization here at the Desotel Faculty of Management, and I'm also editor-in-chief of Delve. Now, before the holidays, I had the privilege to have a chat with an old friend from my native Finland, and he also happens to be the recipient of the 2016 Sveriges Riksbanks Prize in memory of Alfred Nobel, commonly known as the Nobel Prize in Economics, and his name is Bengt Holmström. Bengt is Paul A. Samuelson Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. He's one of the main contributors to the theory of the firm, in particular through his analysis of incentives. We start our discussion by outlining how the theory of the firm understands the nature of a business firm and try to understand how contemporary business firms are changing this understanding. I hope you enjoy our discussion. I certainly did. I would like to begin our discussion with a quote from an earlier Nobel laureate, Herbert Simon, who talks about a visitor from Mars. And suppose that the visitor approaches the Earth from space, equipped with a telescope that reveals social structures. The firms reveal themselves, say, as solid green areas with faint interior contours marking out divisions and departments. Market transactions show as red lines connecting firms forming a network in the spaces between them. Within firms, and perhaps even between them, the approaching visitor also sees pale blue lines, the lines of authority connecting bosses with various levels of workers. As our visitor looked more carefully at the scene beneath, it, it might see one of the green masses divide as a firm divested itself of one of its divisions, or it might see one green object gobble up another. At this distance, the departing golden parachutes would probably not be visible. So a little bit of a joke there at the end. So we're going to be talking about the future of the organization. And I think this analogy from Herbert Simon is pretty elegant. So we have a red lines connecting re- green bubbles and the green bubbles are firms. So let's start with me asking, how do you envision those green bubbles? So, you know, why is it that we see firms and transactions between them in the economy? Well, there is, of course, a long history on this. And, and you know, Simon was early. I think he wrote that, wrote his first things in the, 50, in the 50s. And, and uh, that analogy is apt, I think. Uh, he basically was rebelling, so to speak, against the pure economic theory of general equilibrium. Basically, firms are no bigger, say, than humans, so to speak, or consumers. So they, they were treated and essentially in a similar way. And his point was that a lot of activity takes place inside firms and not, uh, not you know, through the market. And the markets don't exist either in the way it's sort of portrayed in, in general equilibrium theory. That's, of course, an abstraction, so this is not a critique to the general equilibrium theory, but he was uh, wanted to see some, understand what's inside the firm. Another big figure in this context is, of course, Ronald Coase, who also pondered, you know, why they are firms and, and what their role is and how is the labor between firms and uh, markets divided. Now that we have a lot more data, it turns out that there are estimates of how much is transacted inside the firm, at least, you know, and it's about 40 percent, 50 percent goes within firms just across the globe. You know, the same firm transacting with, with itself, this comes from trading data. So it kind of confirms the vision that Simon had. And of course, we have all the you know, interactions like this one. We are not paying anything to each other for doing this. This is also a transaction and so on. So in fact, massive transactions happen outside the market and are non-financial. So the question has been, you know, there are already at least three Nobel Prizes given to the question about what defines the firm and how is it divided? How are transactions placed either through markets or through firms? And the answer keeps coming back. So this is going to be a perennial question. But uh, basically, 
it's seen today as having to do with, with the kind of instruments that are available in markets versus firms, or be, let's put it this way, between firms as opposed to within firms, and the control aspects of it, and also the information aspects of it, and so on. So, so it's all coming down to today, at least, you know, the frictions in the various instruments they are between the firm and the market. So it's hard to go into detail, but roughly, you know, if you have a firm, you have a lot more control of within the firm, but uh, across the market, so to speak, if I transact, two firms transact with each other, the contracting is limited. On the other hand, everything can be in a single firm, you know, it could be a monopoly and so on. So they are, they sort of a trade-off between coordinating within the firm very well versus having uh, stronger incentives in the market. So they behave differently when we transact in the market versus uh, within the firm. So that was a fairly long answer. But you understand that this is 50 years of, of work. And I would say that's the starting point of all of what we call organizational economics. Economics assumes that people are kind of efficiency seeking or, or utility maximizers or something. This is applying it to firms. You know, all, all the things we are doing, we are seeking to make it more efficient is the main hypothesis. And so that divides it. And then the question is, what are sort of the details in this story when it comes to how this is split? And, and it also leads to the fact that we are all the time seeing new forms of organization, uh, or maybe not all the time, but it's evolving. So this question is underlying all the time. And today, data and digitalization has changed the landscape considerably. So has the firms, and the firms organization has changed. So. That's the underlying premise. Bengt Holmström has seen that the conventional boundary between firms and markets has become blurred in some instances. He mentions the Hire Corporation, a Chinese multinational home appliances and electronics company, and McKinsey Consulting as examples. So we've been talking about these milestones in establishing, let's call it the classical picture of the market versus the firm. And, and why is it that we have firms? We've had these, these different answers. And now, as you said earlier, you've yourself witnessed some of these things changing. So for instance, you mentioned that in your work in China, you've seen companies which actually have a market within the firm. That's a recourse to hire, which is a really radical organization. One of the things you see when you study organizations, you see every now and then something very radical coming along mm -hmm. and it succeeds. There were a time when I was at Stanford that people were, you know, there was an organization that just allowed people to take whatever they wanted in terms of wages. There was a kitty and everybody could go there and take. It was very successful because people were hesitant. They actually took less money than when they were on, on pay until one guy took sort of more or less everything. And that was the end of the experiment. And higher is a really radical organization form where basically it's the world's largest white goods producer, that is washers, dryers, you know, all sorts of home appliances, et cetera. So it's a gigantic firm in terms of, of, of scope. And it bought up, for, for instance, uh, the white goods part of General Electric. So it has, it's running also in the West, it's not just China. Their sort of notion of, of how to run the firm is that, that every order they get is bid for within the company. It's easier to, like, to think like it's a, a, a university, you know, that you and I decide that I have a good idea or something. Why don't we start working on it together? There are teams that all the, well, not all the time, but they kind of change their structure as a function of what's being offered to the firm. And they are then bidding, you know, I'm saying, you know, or McKinsey would be like this also somewhat. I go into you and say, do you want to be part of this? I, I want to bid on this contract and I know you are good at these things. So we form a sort of inside the form of, of a structure and then we bid for it. And there's, there's a lot of these sort of micro enterprises inside the firm. And some of them are relatively stable, just like, you know, we could be working together on some projects, you know, for a long time in academia or, or something like that. So, but other structures are, are more looser and, and, and change shape. So this is already radical. I mean, it's usually you have some sales department and so on. But his idea, the Zhang was his fellow who, who thought about it. He, I think he's still a chairman, but maybe he has stepped down by now. He had this notion that everybody has to face the customer. He called it zero distance. You know, everybody working inside the firm should sort of 
feel as if they are just facing the customer all the time and therefore this bidding and so on. And the most radical thing was that we could take actually somebody from outside or somebody from outside could come and say, could come and bid and say, well, do you want Saku to join me? I want to be, you know, here part of, the, of this bid. You know, it's a little mysterious of what's happening. Like all of these things, it's very hard to get the exact notion. But the idea is that you are also confronting challenges from outside. Somebody could come and say, you know, you guys are all the time working with Ben, you know, but I think his ideas are bad and, you know, he's not a good leader and so on. So let me, I'm proposing myself as a leader and here is my plan. And then you guys may suddenly join that guy. So, you know, it's almost like there are no boundaries. Yeah, so there's a simpler example, I guess, say a business school where where you have program leads who staff courses with professors and they get input from students on, on who the student likes and they have the opportunity in some cases to hire outsiders. You might be hired as a professor in that university, but you'll be in trouble if you, you don't get picked up by the program leads. So there is kind of an internal or say in a music school. So there are instrument teachers and then the students give feedback. And in some cases, if they find that a tenured person who's the clarinet teacher in in the music school, you know, that there's somebody else in the market, in the musical community who's better, then the students are demanding that person, then the the tenured person is going to be in trouble if the decision maker doesn't give them students. Yeah. Let me emphasize, you know, hire has not been, like many of these extraordinary experiments, Mm. there are very few companies that have done anything like hire, I believe. I think it is pointing in a new direction, which has been taking place, which is that the the sort of boundaries become more diffuse in general. And it's both firms looking from an inside, outside. We are talking about inverted firms today in where we sort of give various pieces of information. Firms give, give information and access to data inside the firm for outsiders to actually they don't even know who, who will pick up the sort of bits, but outsiders can come and, and propose or, or work out uh, solutions to the firm's problem, innovate things for the firm and so on. So this, this is part of what we call platforms, you know, the platform economy. Yeah. And so they, they design sort of playing fields for outsiders to play, and then they cash in on it in various ways. And in, in the case of innovations, they use these innovations for themselves and so on. So Amazon, for instance, is well, one could say a total platform firm. You know, it's uh, it's transparent, very transparent in some respects to, to the outsiders, and you can come there and help them if you want to, and so on. Higher has tried to do it in a way that was kind of traditional in some ways, but it hasn't been emulated. And when they have gone, you know, to Europe, they own companies in Germany and so on. They run a fall of, you know, labor laws. You are talking about <laughs> unions and others that protest and labor laws. So, so they have had to modify these concepts a lot. One thing that I still they we pioneers in a certain sense in terms of, you know, really facing the customer, getting very close to the customer, having the from inside, everybody inside coming from customer, and some extent also, as I mentioned, outsiders coming in, so to speak. And so I, do, I don't think the higher organization is, is going to, uh, it has a in long enough time to try to manifest itself in, in different parts of the world. And I don't think it has succeeded in that. But the platforms are certainly a worthy and a very significant development. Digitalization. One of the main drivers of change in economy also impacts on organizations at a fundamental level. The platform organization is heralded as the characteristic organizational form for the digital age. So we're seeing that the platform organization has more diffuse boundaries with its environment in, in certain ways, at least. So how would you define a platform organization against the classical picture that we talked about earlier with the green green bubbles and the, the red lines? I would say that the platforms are like an instrument or, or a design feature. Yes, there are platform organizations, but most platforms are still run. Take Apple, for instance. Apple's App Store is a platform. The platform is defined basically by enabling the buyers and sellers to to operate on the platform. I'm thinking of it like a playing field. You own a soccer field and then people will come and they will play there. And they are sort of delivering the value 
by playing with each other matches and so on. But uh, but you you are cashing in on the fact that you know they are playing on your field and you will charge a fee or whatever. Uh, that's one way of thinking about the platforms. The key feature is that buyers and sellers are sort of interacting rather independently of you. So it's in the traditional conception, in order to sort of make money, you have to be between a buyer and a seller. You know, you had to connect, you were an intermediary of some sort in a chain, and you you kind of took your, your fee going from one to the other. In platforms, you just design the interface, but you are, you know, usually it's a, well, it's always a digital interface. And so you decide the code and the rules of the game. You still do one thing that is is critical for the firm because you own that idea and you own that platform the program you can set the rules of the game in that sense eventually of course you think of, of social platforms like uh, facebook or something like that where there's billions of people on it you know at some point you sort of lose control of it i mean you you can do things but there will be a revolution or something like that but you so you are not any more in charge in that sense of, of the platform when i worked with alibaba i had a big discussion once on a panel with a, with the ceo or the new ceo or alibaba and i asked him you know could you begin the spirit of this ownership that we talked about, say, Grossman and Hart, I asked, could you just shut down the platform? Or you have the right, it's your platform. And he adamantly refused to accept the idea that you can shut down the platform. I mean, he, he just thought it was crazy. He didn't understand that he might have a legal right, but he didn't want to concede that to be the case. And I understand him in some ways. He said, you look, look, it's out of my hands in many dimensions, and I can't just go and do whatever I want to do. So these platform economies, uh, I mean, the, the way our thinking in organizational economics works is that we have needs. The basic needs here is obviously for people to meet with each other, find each other, transact with each other. And as I said before, it went through an intermediary, like most firms are intermediaries. Inputs come in and outputs go out, so they are intermediating and doing something about it. Here, that need to match people with each other is served by the platform and and because of digitalization people have an easy find it's a, like an old fa fashioned marketplace you know that was the purpose of marketplaces in the old days you came there to the marketplace and and then buyers and sellers will find each other and, and that's the idea and uh, what what is uh, the reason they have become so popular is that uh, several reasons one of which is this enormous scalability Information is an interesting good because if I use some information, that doesn't prevent you from using the same information. And so information is not like, you know, apples and oranges, which you consume it or I consume it, but we can't both consume the same apple. So information is a very different good. It's what we call a non-rival good. It can be used with everybody. So with this digitalization, especially the mobile internet, the mobile internet is really at the core of everything. You know, you can reach everybody almost 24 seven, everywhere in the world. And with the one push of a button, you can send an email to one person, you can send an email to a billion people if you have all the addresses. So you see that this sort of the cost is very low and the marginal cost is very low. And so they have grown in popularity for this reason. Then come other features like, you know, the data is very valuable that comes from this platform, and that's the thing that usually the owner of the platform monetizes in some manner and provide new services on top of the platform because people are there. Platforms are not going to take over everything, but they are just, at least in my lifetime, in my view, the biggest change in organization, the biggest new idea. In so it's an old idea, but in new clothes, and it's massively important in my view. We talked about ethical challenges that are brought about by new organizational forms such as platforms. In particular, while many of us hate bureaucracy, the consistent governance of ethical and other policy principles in organizations might require a stable hierarchy. Bengt sees a can of worms about to be opened here. So if we look at these, these green bubbles and red lines, the platform organization is different. You know, the, the boundary is more diffuse. The colors bleed into each other because the platform, on the one hand, it includes 
other organizations that operate within the platform and it, it also sucks in the customers if we think about facebook it's it's probably the biggest publishing house in the world and they do almost no content themselves it's basically us the users who who do all the publishing so basically sort of we are facebook and i guess that's that's also interestingly related to what you were saying that can't just close it down even though you, it's like closing down the electrical grid uh, in the winter when people are not not quite but sort of you know people have become dependent on yeah. so it's become a part of their their everyday life but th this kind of leads me to a question because earlier you said that it's harder in such circumstances under such circumstances to actually control what happens and then then there's also a question around say ethics that is a question of sustainability because control is often done for for instance if you want to impose environmental standards on, on how we operate we actually have to you know introduce processes and bureaucracy and we have to control things and this new way of doing things for instance you know having a market within the firm where everybody's just bidding it's harder to control that kind of game so how do you think about let, let's let's take sustainability as an example how do you perceive that that challenge this whole platform idea of course opens up an enormous can of worms in some sense in terms of, of governance. Who is responsible for things? If somebody misbehaves on the platform, is it Apple's problem or is it the persons who the designer of the of the that particular program or that particular you know part of the platform and, and so on? We see it in self-driving cars, you know, is it the coder, you know, is in charge or is it the driver who is, we don't even know what happened, you know, if it's a self-driving car suddenly, you know, go wrong. So we are facing a lot of, of new governance issues in terms of, of how, and, and I know from Alibaba, they thought a lot about governance because they are, after all, designing the rules of the game on the platform in some ways. But then things happen also in the platform and, and, and they can't control everything and they come up with new ideas and, and create new sort of layers on top of the platform that is outside, say, the control of Alibaba or Apple or whatever. And, you know, these are, these are very vexing problems. And, and you asked about sustainability, you know, what happens if they sell some bad products on it? And, and I know from Alibaba, they are constantly, you know, automatically, basically are fo focusing on false goods, but also dangerous goods. They have these screens where, you know, every day they probably catch hundreds of thousands of false products on their platform or misbehavior on their platform. There are disputes on the platform. You know, yeah, I, I claim that, you know, I was supposed to buy this from Zaku and Zaku didn't deliver and so on. By the way, 98% of those disputes are just automatically. They have, they have sort of a bot that checks everything and, and, you know, resolves it and decides in favor because they have so many cases like this. It's kind of a, a law that develops from the cases to see how, how to resolve these issues. So it's very rare that they have to, in person, sort of start to address those issues. But the, whole, the point is, this is an organism that's growing. You know, and it's not under the control of the firm necessarily. I mean, that comes part and parcel from going outside the firm. By the way, Hire was sort of thinking of people coming into the firm, so to speak. But the platform is a very different philosophy that you are externalizing sort of things and you are controlling it from a distance and a certain design distance. But a lot of issues here are unsettled and, and especially in the financial markets. As we now know, we have seen the FTX scandals and so on. You know, these are, uh, that's not particularly platform related, but the platform was an enabler, but it, there was other things going on. But, but there's a lot of issues in fintech on legalists, what can be done on these firms and, and how to regulate them and so on. So we, there are massive changes happening in an effort to deal with, with these problems. I'm sure the law will have to change in many ways. Bureaucracy, which was a term that was developed by Max Weber, a sociologist, to describe the basic rules of a hierarchical organization, it's become a dirty word in, in many circles. So it's kind of used to, to blame an organization for being inefficient. And so, of course, not by everybody, but it has this negative connotation. And it's kind of funny because it's very, very hard to impose 
accountability in an organization if you don't have some kind of a bureaucratic structure, if you don't have what you mentioned as governance, that it's a governance problem. If you want to, to enforce certain certain principles or values or, or rules, processes, we, we have to have some structure of accountability. So so it is it is a vexing problem, as you said. Let me say on the bureaucracy, I mean, I, I think one of the things that have, uh, came out from thinking about these problems was that if you go back to the idea that we are seeking to be efficient, as soon as you say that, you understand that bureaucracy is as old as the firehouse and older. It's got to be that it's also a very important function. And you pointed your finger partly to the function, you know, we need to control people, we need to govern them and, and you know, and, and we need to have, we have responsibility, but we therefore also have power to, you know, make decisions about how things are running inside this world. This notion that bureaucracy is some illness, is excess bureaucracy may be an illness, but, you know, just like you know, fever or something like that is actually a defense mechanism to something. So is bureaucracy. It's in the first instance a brilliant solution to a very complicated problem. I mean, if you think of Neanderthals, they would have loved to have a bureaucracy. <laughs> you know, arguably bureaucracy arose at the same time with the agricultural surplus. So, so, you know, when we saw the first, you know, more complex societies emerge, when, when certain people were able to, to do other things than just grow or hunt food. So we had agricultural surplus. So we saw that, you know, you mentioned Asian Egypt. So it was the same time when, when bureaucracy was born, you know, what we now call bureaucracy, obviously, the later term that we had mathematics and, and, and written language, because those were, you know, created to, to deal with the same coordination challenges that you have wanted to do something a bit more complex, like build a monument to your king. So you need people, you need, need to manage them, you need to manage resources, you need to find ways of, of running an organization. So yeah, so it, it is funny, but I, I suppose you know, there are lots of reasons why, why people don't like what they perceive as bureaucracies. After we defended the honor of bureaucracy as a governing mechanism, Bengt reminds us that the market also serves an important ethical role by defending freedom of choice for individuals. He calls this the exit option. Let me get back in that context just to the boundary question which you started from. Mm. And now maybe this is a moment to, to bring a little bit back Simon's picture. So on one hand, firms have an er- it's not a democracy of all. You know, it's enormously, there's bureaucracy, there's rules, there's regulations, you know, the, the firm has a lot of power to design itself the way it wants to. I mean, just look at Elon Musk now, what he's doing to Twitter. I mean, yeah. You know, he is the owner, so he does all sorts of crazy things. So what is the option for people? You may say, well, if you, they do those crazy things, should we protect these people? Well, there is the protection mechanism in that Simon picture is that I step out of that green block and go to some other green block that is much, much nicer. Mm. So do you see that the, the exit option that people have, customers, suppliers, workers, they all have exit options. And that's the critical thing for a competitive, you know, a, a capitalistic system is you have to give people exit options. If there are exit options, then that tends to be a healthier system. And that, uh, whether that's selling your share and not being part of a company more or exit as a worker and going to another worker. So you see that giving choice is really at the center of a well-functioning capitalistic firm. And rightly, therefore, you know, monopolies and those things are not just because of, you know, we focus very much on price distortions when we have monopolies. It's just as much, you know, a distortion in terms of getting a chance to, you know, serve a central purpose in, in a proper way. So, you know, this gives a much broader sense of the importance of having alternatives and not having monopolies. And that's the dilemma, by the way, of the government. If you think of Iceland, you know, it's like these blobs are like little islands, Icelands, islands. But, uh, but Iceland is an island. But it, mm. it, it's not in the sense of, of, of an island in Simon's picture, because Icelanders have no, yes, they can exit, you know, they can go to some other country or something like that, but they lose it. There's no other Iceland to go to where people speak Icelandic and so on. You see, so governments are dealing with a much more complicated problem about legitimacy. They, they have to respect a lot of 
for bureaucracy and but the legislation is really critical so they have to give everybody the right to do what be fair to people you know people say why can't government just be as efficient as i don't you sort of bring markets inside government i mean it's because government has a much more challenging problem i mean firms can decide you know behave like elon musk if they wish you see they are free to do it largely but they pay the price by people leaving whereas government can't be given those rights they they have just a hugely bigger problem in designing a, what we might call efficient systems and they are bureaucratic and they are slow and they are you know this and they are that because people don't have exit options yeah so you can't privatize your police force because you know the no no you can't it's, have several police forces competing you know that would be somewhat problematic so like, that's so yeah. I'm very sympathetic in that sense to government's dilemma government has a much more demanding organizational dilemma more complex dilemma and besides it also gets the things that market cannot solve the government gets stuck with with things that markets can't solve But how do new organizational forms such as platforms impact on leadership? Bank predicts that some pretty old school leadership practices might still be in vogue in platform organizations, however new they might otherwise be. I'm sometimes disturbed when governments nowadays talk about strategies. Governmental organizations want to, to draft strategies because you know the strategies are basically done by firms who can basically choose their customers. The customers can exit, they can go somewhere else if they're not happy. But so the government, they have to serve each citizen exactly the same. That's a basic principle of democracy. And sort of that's why they have the types of organizations that they do. And people have to use voice. You you had me read, read the Hirschman book about exit, exit voice and loyalty, which talks about, you know, within this known competitive system, you know, how you want, how you change an organization is, is through through voice rather than through exit. I wanted to ask you one more thing before we we conclude which is is about the leadership. Let's step back from government, let's go back to the the new type of an organization that we see emerging whether it's it's a kind of a mix of a market and a and an organization or, or perhaps even more it's a platform. And you mentioned the talking to a CEO of Alibaba. Uh, so you've, you've actually interacted with executives who are dealing with the emergence of this new type of an organization. How does that change the task of leadership, in your view? If you look at Amazon, which is the extreme case of this, a very successful, you know, platform, mm. you can see the, the the Jeff Bezos, you know, decided that they would change to a, to a kind of a platform organization inside as well as outside initially inside that is to to make all the data communication inside the firm be based on apis that are are defining you know how these different computers talk to each other and so on sorry to interrupt bank's flow for a moment just in case you are like me and did not know what an api is api is an acronym for application programming interface in a nutshell it is a set of rules specifying how two software programs should interact with each other as bank just said apis are defining how subsystems of platforms interact with each other now that i'm done googling let bank continue Uh, which made it basically possible for everybody to see how data flows inside the firm. So it made the inside of the firm very transparent relative to what it had been. He, by the way, decided it just one day. He said he sent the famous uh, Bezos manifesto where he said that, that from now on, from today on, everything has to be done through APIs. So that, you know, no, you cannot go and take a sheet of paper with data and give it to me. And, and we would sort of communicate in that everything has to be sort of recorded in this network of APIs. And, and the whole organization in that sense became very modularized. And he finished the memo, but it was an email. He said, finish the memo. Anybody who doesn't do this will be fired. And the last sentence was, have a nice day. So do you see how he used his power? He just with yeah. one email changed the whole organization. And that dramatically changed everything. Then he started to invite, give these APIs to customers. And lo and behold, competitors even. And lo and behold, their business just kept growing. 
you know, the, so suddenly, you know, having your deep secret, so to speak, and giving it out, having it shown inside and giving it outside, you know, much more transparency. It was just, a, it's revolutionary in some sense. And that's what they have been doing, you know, uh, with, with, so, so it has changed a lot of organizations. Take, take the cloud computing, you know, the whole idea that, that, you know, nowadays we have sort of virtual, virtual machines and you go, you go, I mean, it has lowered the cost of starting small companies, for instance, because you, you can start a company in a week. You know, everything, you, you just rent time on the cloud and you, you have programs for handling your, your sales, you have programs for handling your, your, your whole sort of enterprise data management systems you can get on the cloud. So, so this has changed the challenges from outside. It has streamlined what happens inside. It has made much easier to see who is making what kind of money in the company. And it's, in that sense, it's kind of inventing the mark. It's like a little bit like, a, maybe that's the most similar thing to, to hire that they sort of in some ways have become much more market-like, the whole, the whole system and, and the intermediary landscape you know, where they used to be intermediaries like banks and things like that. All those things are enormously challenged by this. They had to really change them. So let's explore that a little bit more. If we can spend five more minutes talking about leadership. You used the example of Jeff Bezos. And one thing he's known for is that he is, he is passionately promoting customer benefits, but he's also arguably ruthless towards his staff. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the way that Amazon is governed, in particular how Amazon staff is being governed. And also, I, I think that the notion that, that yes, it's a, it's transparent like a market. But on the other hand, we, we've seen a lot of arguments towards companies needing to have a purpose that unites the staff, and which would seem to be completely opposite, you know, as, as a philosophy, because markets, arguably, they don't have purpose, that they're, they're basically media of exchange between people who are promoting whatever they're promoting, but they, you know, a market doesn't have a purpose as such. But there's been several books published this year, for instance, about how private firms need to have, have purpose. It, it is true that, that, that people, that's a, that's a whole different subject in some ways, you know, why, why are people seeking so much purpose right now and I have theories for that but I want to say first specifically on the point you are talking about you know ruthlessness and so on I mean yes Bezos is running his company in a rather ruthless sense but he turns out to be even more ruthless to himself that is it's part of his sort of DNA he thinks everybody should be willing to give their 120 percent or something of their time and of course what happens there is that there's a lot of selection then you know, so that's one way in which the capitalistic market works is that there is this company, but not every company is certainly not going to become an Amazon type, you know, sweatshop mm -hmm. or something like that. So he, he has a chance to select from people that he thinks are similarly disposed or something like that. Amazon is actually, there is something that people like in Amazon, which is it's very modularized. So you mm -hmm. get to, as long as you sort of submit to this API kind of plugs where you where you communicate in a particular way, you are really free to innovate yourself and you are, innov you are free to innovate, you know, own M APIs. And, and so it's not a competitive market necessarily. It, it's, a, it's a market where you are very free to do things in your little sort of bubble of influence and all the time thinking what is valuable also in this composite of bubbles in the whole firm. So, so, you know, as I said, maybe McKinsey or something like that is the closest that people in McKinsey don't know very much about what each other do, but they communicate with certain protocols and they have certain templates that they are sort of set of rules of the game, but teams reform and for, it has this sort of fluid structure inside that is somewhat similar and universities uh, may be another other example. So our university, as you know, we are pretty competitive. You know, it's not, it's not exactly a, you know, we cooperate, but we also compete, at least here in the US and I assume also in Canada. But yeah, arguably, so I don't know of a university where you could send out an email, you know, saying that it's all gonna change, have a good day. So it, it doesn't, we don't play like no, that. No, no, that's the that's a difference. That's a difference. Yeah. That's partly maybe a difference because we also have tenure systems and so on. But the 
purpose thing is very interesting because I think it has a lot to do with sociology and the anxieties related to what's happening in the world in general. And just to be provocative, you know, my sense is that we are moving to higher orders of of intellectual activity in the sense that the world is more about asking the right questions and less about answering questions. And I think human race has through the 100,000 years, you know, they, have, they haven't had to ask questions or invent problems, so to speak, uh, because they have all the time challenged. They have had to find foods, they had to fi- fend off enemies, they have to kill animals, you know, that could eat them and so on. So, you know, it's not like people in the 1800s sat there, you know, children and said, what, what should I do? It was just all the time a lot to do to just survive. And so the purpose was very simple, uh, uh, which was to survive and, and get food. And we have reached a state where we don't have to really. We go to the store and we get our food if we want and so on. So, so I think it's a shift from, you know, what should I be doing? What should I be doing to survive to just asking what should I be trying to do? Because everything is sort of the, the first order in the Maslow scheme, you know, the first order of things have been solved. And I think, as you know well, as an academic, academic is what's hard in academia is not solving problems. It's asking the right questions. And, even, you know, if you have a good question, it's worth a go. And we know that that is the biggest hurdle in, say, doctoral studies. You know, the, the shifting from answering exam questions to actually coming up with a question that you would research. So asking questions is a lot harder. Asking good questions is a lot harder than answering questions. Answering a good question, hundreds of people can do that. So, so your hypothesis is that, you know, the widespread existential anxiety that, that human race is experiencing is now directed towards firms, that we, we want firms to give us purpose so that, that our anxieties would be lessened, so that we wouldn't have to do that work ourselves. I think, I mean, that's not the only, you know, I think the sense of community and so on that existed before and the mentorships that existed before and the attachment to, you know, it's kind of you were in some kind of club or whatever one's, what's the call in mind. These are, these are obviously very important elements also. That, mm. that, but I, th- I think this thing about, this talk about freedom and do what, makes you happy. I mean, is there a more stupid recommendation than say, do what you feel makes you happy? If I knew what makes me happy, I would do it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I I mean, the problem is I don't know what makes me happy. I think this is an absolutely wonderful place to to end this conversation. Thank you, Bengt, so much for for joining us. And I wish you a very, very good day in in Boston. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to a conversation about the future of the business firm between Nobel Prize winner in economics and MIT professor Bengt Holstrom and Desotel professor and Delve editor-in-chief Saku Montre. Listen to more episodes of the Delve podcast and read articles based on management research at delve.mcgill.ca. You can follow Delve McGill on all podcasting apps on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to the Delve McGill podcast and follow us for critical thinking and insights on management today.